A quick thank you to Charlie Sparks for redesigning the Delightful logo. I hope you love the new look as much as I do. Thanks, Charlie. Young, welcome to Delightful! At last, it's time to kick off the much-anticipated Dragon series! Aurora needs a posse of dragon friends, don't you think? Just like with the Evolution series, you guys helped me choose the order of these dolls over on Instagram. I'll admit, I threw Dark into the mix as an afterthought. I had no idea it would be so popular. So we're starting with Dark. Let's get into the concept art. Dark. What do you think of when you hear the word? What became immediately apparent is how diverse this topic is. Unlike Earth or Fire, which seem pretty straightforward, dark could be interpreted in a number of ways. There's thematically dark, like evil, witchcraft, and sorcery, or even death. Then there's the unknown or mysterious connotation to the word dark, like I'm being kept in the dark, or what lurks in the dark. Gothic-style cathedrals and architecture also comes to mind with its spiky and dangerous yet hauntingly beautiful designs. Lastly, I tried to think of actual, observable things that are naturally black in color. Where to begin, right? You'll see evidence of all these ideas in the sketches to follow. In these early sketches, I explored body shapes and wing design to try and get a hold of the character I was going for. I was a little overwhelmed with what direction to pursue, so I came up with 14 sets of horns for starters and asked you guys which ones you liked best. 12 won the vote by a landslide, with 1 and 3 following up behind. Taking these horns, I tried to develop full character sketches from there. Unfortunately, it did not come easily. After that brainstorm, I focused on the winning pairs of horns once again and came up with four heads each per horn. These didn't help me much. All of these could work, it just depends what I want to pursue, right? We've got some warrior-like characters, some sorcerers, some wild tribal-like designs. It seemed like I was going in circles, so I took a step back and sketched up these tiny designs, mostly focusing on the silhouette. Now we're getting somewhere! At last, I was able to produce three complete character concepts for you to vote on, again. After counting the votes and processing all the feedback and critique, I revised these concepts and produced a second pass of designs. And with all these designs done, the final vote was cast. You guys really came through and decided design 1B was the one to make. To make her, let's use Force Captain Adora from the She-Ra Dolls line. I'm choosing her for her petite frame and delicate features. Had we gone with a more warrior s design, I might have chosen a big doll. But because we're taking the mysterious sorceress route, I want the character's strengths to lie in intelligence and magic, not physical prowess. This doll's head is already small enough to match Aurora's, so I won't have to shrink it this time. Alright, let's get rolling with this. Pop off her head, tie off the hair, and give her a close shave with a sharp pair of scissors. Dig out the rest with pliers, and she's ready for customization. She needs a digitigrade dragon legs, so we'll have to reconstruct her existing ones. I make two cuts per leg, one above the knee and one mid-shin. I'm using my Dremel tool this time, like I've seen Doll's brand new look do. It sure is faster than the jeweler's saw. I'll be doing plenty of cutting and sanding during this project, so here's the obligatory safety warning. Wear the necessary protection you need. I'm sporting goggles and a respirator's mask, which I wear honestly for 90% of this project. I cut off her knee so I could reattach it at a 90 degree angle like this, see? Her femur still looks too long, so I'm going to whack off a bit more. Great! Let's reassemble them. I'll be using the same popsicle stick approach as I did with Aurora. I drill all the necessary holes and add structure out of chopsticks to extend the lower leg. This doll's proportions are much more realistic, so she's not equipped with the shins for days that Monster High dolls come with. After cutting the shin to create the new joint, it looks much too short. So 
so I had to lengthen it. I hold the pieces together with hot glue before drilling through all of the pieces and connecting them more firmly with wire. To put her femur back together, I drill a hole into the middle, twist some wire around the knee joint, and shove it back in there. I attach a couple more wires in and around the knee for more connection points, and fill in the rest of the space with hot glue. I want to try something different with the toes this time. Aurora's toes look cute, but the toe on the inside is prone to popping off with enough force. So I came up with a different approach. One long dowel per foot with three loops of wire or toes that can slide on. While I've got the wire out, we can make the armature for her ears and horns. Mark where you want the horns to be, then insert three wires into the head, forming a triangular base. Push them out through the neck hole so that you can twist them together, and then pull them back inside the head. Now you can twist and shape the wire to form a skeleton for the horns. I do the same thing for her ears. With the structures in place, we can start sculpting. I'll be using my favorite two-part epoxy sculpt. Mix equal parts A and B, then get to work. The first pass is just for bulking up shapes and filling in gaps. The legs need more bulking up than I expected, so to save an epoxy, I do the majority of bulking up with cheaper materials. In other words, scrap paper and hot glue. It worked out with the demon doll, right? What could go wrong? Epoxy sculpt takes anywhere from 3 to 7 hours to cure, depending on temperature and humidity. Once it does, it's time for the second pass. Now we can start the cosmetic sculpting. I flesh out the toe beans into claw shapes, and bulk up the horns. Dab water on your gloves and stroke the surface for a smoothing effect. Whether it's two, three, or four passes, build up and sculpt the details. You may have noticed one of my inspirations for this design was Ancient Greece, for their ties to astrology and early mathematics. To make her appear more Greek, I build up that classic sloped nose shape that we see in ancient sculptures and in many Greek people today. I spent a long time on the feet, trying to create a concave shape in which the claws could retract into. I was aiming for something like a cat's claw mechanism. I created three recesses, all with very thin walls. Temporarily screw the leg together with the nut on the outside of the body. Cover it up with epoxy and let that harden nice and solid before you remove the screw. On the inside, lay down a snake of epoxy around the screw head and blend it in. This hides the screw and bolt from view so it looks more like a real leg, but it remains detachable in case you ever need to work on it or tighten the joint. Alright, everything's been sculpted so it's time to move on to... Sanding! We want our mods to flow seamlessly into the original doll. I start with a rough grain to scratch off the biggest bumps, and then work my way down to finer and finer grains of sandpaper, until both the epoxy and plastics are nice and smooth. At last, everything is smoothed. However, despite my best efforts on the claws, they just look... icky. It's fine in the retracted position, but when the toes extend forward, they leave three gaping holes behind them. 
Something about it looks creepy, and it's not at all what I was aiming for. I should have planned that out better. Well, at least I gave it a shot. Take two on the legs. This time, I'm putting the holes through the center of each toe and use sturdy wire loops, one per toe, to create the articulation. Each wire is then glued onto the leg and reinforced with more epoxy sculpt. Then it's back to sanding town, and a couple hours later, we've got a much prettier set of tootsies. Let's move on to the tail, shall we? I measure how long I need the tail to be, then cut a length of wire twice as long so that I can fold it in half and twist it together for strength. This loop will go into the body, so I wrap the end together with jewelry wire to make sure it stays. That's a long tail. Because this dragon's body is smooth, not scaly, I was aiming for an unusual semi-alien skin look since she's a dark space-themed character, so I'm opting to give her a fabric tail over the segmented nesting cups look. Like I made for Vaporeon. One of the critiques I got on Vaporeon's tail is that the fabric scrunches up when I pose it. So to try and minimize scrunching, I'm going to cut out the fabric in the shape of the tail. I draw a pattern on paper and add seam allowance. I'll need two tail pieces and 14 spikes. So front and back spikes together, essentially forming seven triangular pockets. Then turn all the pockets inside out, and stuff a tiny amount of fluff inside to make them 3D. I'm using discarded fluff created from making yarn hair wefts. Run them under the machine one more time to seal in the fluff. And the spikes are ready to be sewn into the tail. Place them facing inside the tail and pin them in place. I want the spikes to gradually decrease in size as they go down her tail, so I pull the ladder spikes outward. Then lay the other half of the tail on top. Now we can stitch the tail together all the way around, but make sure to leave a gap. I cut off the excess and clip the curves of the fabric before flipping it inside out. Ta-da! Feeding it onto the wire and stuffing it at the same time was a little tricky because you want the wire to float in the middle of the plush tail, ideally. So I used long tools to stuff in fluff at both ends, trying to evenly disperse it around the wire. Mark her lower back and drill a big ol' hole in there. Using a smaller drill bit, I create a perpendicular hole through the sides of her body. That way we can run a wire through, Catch the loop of the tail like this, and feed it back out the other side. Trim the wire down and set it in place with epoxy glue. With a needle and thread, I close the gap in the tail and try to bring the fabric in close to the body. The tip of her tail has a ball, which I've already made out of, you guessed it, wire and epoxy sculpt, which I stitch to the end of the fabric. The tail ended up a little bigger than I wanted, so to tighten the fabric at the end of the tail, I used the ladder stitch to bring in and cinch up the fabric. Before we move on, I did make a couple more mods with epoxy. The tail looked detached, so I bulked up that area. I sealed the loose tip of the tail behind the ball, and I built up the doll's back to form a flat plateau shape in preparation for the wings. Alright, she's looking pretty good. Let's tackle the wings. Looking at my concept again, this dragon's wings are different. They're not supposed to look like flesh and bone. Rather, I was aiming to create negative space, as if you're looking into a void showing the vastness of space. I think this comes across in the concept art, so the question is how to translate that into real life. I want these wings to stay slim and flat, so to help keep the shape all the way out to the tips of the wings, I cut long curves out of cereal box cardboard. Then I glue on popsicle sticks, which are more sturdy.
The pieces should slide easily over each other, so I glued the middle stick to the opposite side of the cardboard, like this. Then drill all the holes. Along with all those tiny screws and bolts, the last piece of the wings are the hinges. This is what the entire structure looks like before assembly. Remember this? Loctite will keep the nuts screwed tight onto the threads of the screws after it dries, so we don't have to worry about them loosening with use. I suspect the cardboard might warp over time, so as a precaution, I stitched a wire down the outside for strength. Similarly to how we made the tail, I used the armature to sketch up a pattern. The scalloped edges of the wing echo the many curves of this doll's design. The horns, the orb, the spirals, even her limbs are smooth and rounded. The fabric I plan on using is this stuff. Look at it, it's so cool. That ear doesn't affect is mesmerizing. I cut out four pieces, two per wing. Right sides together, I sew all the way around the exterior, leaving a gap to turn the wings. My machine really didn't like this fabric. I don't know if I need a different setting or a different presser foot, but I gave up and did it by hand instead. It took longer, but whatever gets the job done. Clip the curves and turn it inside out. I press the seams to get them to lay flat, but this fabric really does not want to iron flat. Feed the structures into each wing, and then close the gap, snugging it up nice and close to the hinge. I like the shape, but they didn't iron flat, and the fabric is trying to poof out. How should we fix this? I pinned everything down and dotted on stars with white paint. Using the stars as markers, I take white thread and create small stitches that pass through both layers of the fabric, helping hold them together. To transition to the next star, I feed the thread in between the two layers before making the next stitch. This hides all the ugly stuff inside, and the front and back of the wings still look good. Eventually, with enough stitches, I felt the two sides of the fabric were securely attached and would no longer gap open. The puckering effect is somewhat undesirable, though. Did I just switch out one problem for another? Several constellations show up on her wings, which will be presented through embroidery. I stitch back and forth through both sides of the wings until the constellation is complete. Most of them I just made up, but this one's real. As another loose reference to Greece, I stitched an owl constellation onto her right wing. The owl is a well-known symbol of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, inspiration, mathematics, among other things. Because this character is meant to be an intellectual sorceress type, I thought it was a good match. This seems like a good time to glue on the wing spikes. Now we can start painting. Up until this point, they haven't really looked like space. Using black acrylic paint right out of the tube, I brush on the black and start forming a gradient. I dab black, dark purple, and blue around other random parts of the wings. Using white fabric paint, I dot on many, many stars to form that starry sky. I come back with light blue and lilac paint to pick out certain stars. If you look up into the night sky, you can see that stars come in all sorts of colors, so I find adding a subtle variety to the white makes it look more realistic. And last but not least, you know they got a glow in the dark. To keep with the color palette, I sought out and purchased this blue glow in the dark paint. It's more opaque than I was expecting, but I guess that's fine. to the body. That's right, I'm not done with you yet. We've used polyester fabric dye to dye hair on this channel before, but did you know you can dye the body as well? 
I've seen many fellow customizers try this with varying degrees of success, so it's about time I gave it a shot. I'll be mixing blue and red dyes to form a deep purple. That's right, these are the same dyes left over from Espeon's hair. If you store them in glass jars, they last forever. Add enough dye and water to submerge the doll. For clearer instructions, feel free to pause and read the packet. Bring it to a boil and keep it on a medium-high heat. Alright, here goes nothing. Just when I thought this hobby couldn't get any weirder. The head took the dye really well, and look at that, it actually dyed the epoxy too. I did not expect that to happen. In goes the body. Nice that I can use the tail as a handle. Might as well shove everything back in there and let it soak for a while. I waited about 20 minutes. Today on Cooking with Delightful. <laughs> it seems to have taken very well. For experimental purposes, I popped Manny in there to see how Monster High Bodies take the dye. Rinse off all the pieces with cold water and set them aside to dry. Let's see how they did. Very interesting. The colors came out differently depending on the original color of the plastic, of course, but it is interesting to see how different plastics absorb the dye. The monster high legs and forearms didn't do so well, whereas the body and certainly the vinyl head absorbed a lot of color. Okay, you've probably noticed the weird globs coming out of her body. Yeah, that's the hot glue. It heated up in the hot water, melted, and oozed out of the crevices. Yikes. I'm honestly disappointed in myself for not predicting this. I should have seen this coming. I'll have to fix this before we can proceed. I reheat the body to remove stubborn bits of hot glue and re-squish the leg joints into place. Then it's yet another round of epoxy and sanding, which brings us to this point. At last, we can move outside to the airbrush station. I'll be using these Vallejo paints on the doll. What was the point of dyeing the doll if you're just going to paint her anyway, you're probably thinking. Well, if she'd taken the dye really well, I wouldn't have to be painting her black right now. Even so, the dye reached in and stained the joints, which are the most problematic areas when changing a doll's skin color. So if and when the paint rubs off around the joints, you won't notice the chipping as much. So I think it was worth it despite the hot glue mishap. Seal in the paint with two to three layers of varnish. After the varnish, I usually use Mr. Super Clear Matte Sealant to get rid of the gloss, but I'm kind of liking the shine, on the body anyway. So I thought I'd try semi-gloss on the body and the usual matte sealant on the face. Yeah, MSC comes in a bunch of textures. Let's give her hair. This is Black Magic from DollyHair.com. Because she's got new ears and huge horns, there's not much real estate left on the scalp for hair. So to avoid a thin looking reroute, I'm being generous with the amount of hairs per plug. Once everything's all filled in, I seal the deal with galaxy glue. That's appropriate. I tie off her hair into ponytails so that I can keep track of the part and then mask off her face in preparation for the face up. She also gets a fresh coat of sealant. It was a fairly straightforward face this time. Very graphic and contrasty with an emphasis on her spooky black eyes. I start off with watercolor pencils and soft pastels and work in some acrylic paints for that deep black opacity. I 
I also use paints to build up the light gradient on the lower area of her face. I find it really difficult to get a smooth gradient with a brush. I wish I'd done this part with the airbrush. Eventually, with enough layers and a helping of pastels, it's good enough. Those bright moon-like pupils clearly need to glow in the dark as well, so I'm delicately gluing on luminescent blue powder. With Liquitex varnish, gloss the lips and eyes for a lifelike shine. Although I tried to cover it up with pastels, that crack along her forehead is really bothering me. I know it's not in the concept art, but I had to cover it up with something, so let's give her a mystical third eye, shall we? This is already a long video, but we still have paint jobs, clothes, and accessories to go. I value your time, so let's make this quick. Paint! I've painted fabric before with good results, but that was working from light to dark. Here I started with black fabric and had to build up a lot of paint to reach the level of opacity I needed. This made the fabric very stiff and the folds very noticeable. Clothes! Inspired by ancient Greek togas, I sewed together this garment out of three separate fabrics. My original plan was to paint on a nice gradient like I did for the tail, but to heck if I'm going to make that mistake again. So I sacrificed the smooth gradient look for more functionality. Using a simple macrame square knot, I wrap gray embroidery thread around the body of the doll to form decorative straps. I end the threads with beads. I use this bead because it looks like a planet. Accessories! One of the coolest parts of this doll is the nifty orb that floats between her horns. I want it to glow, so I mixed blue glow-in-the-dark UV powder into my mold. Everything sank to the bottom as it cured. For attempt number two, I cured sections of the orb at a time, and after three sessions, it came out pretty good. I embedded a wire into this orb so that I could thread it around her horn for that levitating effect. Not one to waste materials, I turned the failed orb into a staff using a wood chopstick and wire. She also received a tiny manicure out of paper and glue. Alright, now we can combine all the pieces together. I heat up the head and cram it back on over the neck peg. Using the hot knife technique, I style the hair and press it flat. Finally, the wings screw into the back, and we can call this doll done. Say hello to our dark dragon, Neeks. Thanks to commenter Cass Wolf for the suggestion. To be honest, I imagined the dark dragon to be the oddball of the bunch. Like I hinted at earlier, I have clearer visions for earth, sea, fire dragons, so it felt like the dark dragon would come last and be the most different design. Maybe that's why it threw me for such a loop, having to design her first. Am I making sense? Getting experimental with your artwork is a good thing, something that should be encouraged. But that doesn't mean you're going to find success every time. I failed pretty hard at several points, but at least I learned from the experience. I'll admit, it is frustrating to have spent so long on a project only to be dissatisfied with the end result. Especially when I know how many of you were looking forward to this. I don't want to disappoint you. Is this another Nova situation? Is she really as bad as I'm making her out to be? Am I thinking too hard about this? The final doll follows the concept art very closely, and yet, I like the artwork way more than the doll. What happened? Should I have used a Monster High doll after all? 
How would you have approached the wings? I don't like that they ended up looking like quilted blankets. I definitely should have printed custom fabric to use for her tail and outfit instead of painting it. At any rate, I hope you at least found this video entertaining, and let me know your thoughts about her in the comments. Ooh, that was a roller coaster of a project for me. And there's four more dragons to come. Subscribe so that you never miss a video, and make sure you follow my Instagram to cast your votes and voice your opinions for the next doll's design. Thank you so much for watching. Stay artsy. Annyeong!